My name is Nick Bendel. I'm the owner of Hunter and Scribe, and I am going to be on the online prosperity show. You're going to hear me talk about having lunch with 500 strangers, using content marketing to grow your business, and some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about content marketing. I can't wait to chat with Prosper. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show. I'm your host, Prosper Taravinga, and boy, do I have a great guest for you today. Today, we've got Nick Bendel, the owner of Hunter and Scribe, a renowned... How are you doing today? I am doing very well, Prosper, mate. I love your energy. This is going to be a lot of fun. Fantastic. Well, I've been looking at you and spying on you on social media and watching while salivating as well as you have all these remarkable lunches with um, you know, strangers. And we're going to be talking about that uh, on the show today. I digress. Nick here, um, is the owner and founder of Hunter and Scribe. That is a renowned copywriting and content marketing agency that specializes in property and finance, right? And Nick's unique experiences also include a time when he spent 999 days uh, on a journey around Australia. We're going to talk about that because I've done a trip around Australia as well, but not exactly in the way that you have done it. And we're also going to look at how he helps his clients stand out with expert knowledge hard data and a commitment to simplicity now get ready for insights success stories and valuable tips that are generally going to boost your online prosperity now let's dive in nick tell us a little bit about how you started off with hunter and scribe and why you particularly chose to work with property and finance professionals well prosper before founding hunter and scribe i was a journalist and i wrote about property and finance, in particular, mortgage broking and the business of being a real estate agent. And so when I founded my copywriting agency, Hunter and Scribe, back in 2018, it was probably inevitable that we should end up specializing in property and finance. Fantastic. And honestly, with the way, um, you know, property and finance is usually the flavor of the month, depending on the cycles and everything else, these guys really need to make decisions when it comes to, uh, you know, their wealth and also their investments. Now, people um you know when they show up at your doorstep the property and finance uh professionals yeah it's one of these things for us where for, for the client because it can be such a consequential decision the decision to buy a home can be very significant you're talking six or seven figures maybe or the decision to invest your savings by a financial advisor that's very significant and so Trust is a really significant issue if you're a property and finance professional. You need to win the trust of your potential clients. And so they need to trust you in two ways. First, they need to trust that you're honest. But second, they also need to trust that you're competent, that you're skilled. You might be the world's most honest person, but if you're completely useless, why would they want to use you? So they need to somehow not just get recognized by potential clients and referral partners, but also impress upon these people that they are trustworthy and someone they can do business with. And that is challenging. Absolutely. And we all know that people do business with those they know, like, and trust. And considering that this is people's finances, this is people's memories in terms of real estate, and this is people's hard and cash, they really want to make sure that they're utilizing it uh, or, you know, investing it with the right kind of people with the best interest at heart. Now, you spoke about trust, and trust is one of those things that really um permeates especially in what you write and how you show up in the world it takes a lot of trust for somebody to come and have lunch with you per se and you seem to be a little bit more about that whole episode in your life um and why that is particularly important this um you know time of of your career so, so uh, prosper you touched on this Wonderful adventure I'm, I'm on where I'm having lunch with 500 strangers. Yes. yes. And I stole the, 
I, I stole the idea off an amazing woman in Melbourne named Kaylee Chu. Kaylee had lunch with 100 strangers in 2018 and she published a book on the subject in 2019 and I bought the book and it is such a great book. And Kaylee inspired me to have lunch with 500 strangers. Kaylee was actually my first lunch. And I'm deliberately meeting people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all different ages, all different professions. And the reason I'm doing that, partly I just find it really interesting. And also part of the reason I'm on this adventure prospect is I want to learn. And I figure the best way to learn is to meet people you wouldn't normally meet because then you're having conversations you wouldn't normally have, which means you're going to learn things you wouldn't normally learn. And so I'm learning a lot. I'm making some incredible friends, building an amazing network, having so much fun. But I, I'm also, I, I've also really improved my social skills a lot because I'm not an outgoing person. I'm actually someone who is quite antisocial by nature. I like to stay at home on my own. So that's really helped. And it's also strengthened my mindset from having to put myself out there and from being around so many amazing people. And you also touched on the fact that after I have these lunches, I often publish information about my lunches on social media. And that's helped me build a bit of a profile and to touch on what you said about people knowing, liking and trusting you, that's helped me become known, liked and trust, trusted, which in turn, and I, I didn't expect this, but in turn that has helped me grow my business. Absolutely, because things that I always look out for is who is immediately and what sort of person are they? And I always wonder what conversations you guys are having and it turns out you have actually learned quite a lot, um, you know, during these these uh, lunches. What sort of impact has this, um, you know, put on your perception on people and community, considering you have said that you were antisocial before? Well, I've, I, th I think I've learned a lot about people and human behavior and communication and social interaction. I, I'm not... Uh, the world's leading expert on any of these things by any means, but I, I feel like I'm a lot more knowledgeable. I, I've, I've learned, a, I, I've had a, a few revelations along the way, Prosper. So one thing I've discovered is it's so easy to look at other people and think, oh, you know, Prosper's got his stuff together. He's so confident. He's so switched on. I wish I could be like him. But funnily enough, you eventually realize that maybe you're looking at me thinking, oh my God, I wish I could be like Nick. Nick is so confident and switched on. And it, it's funny, we we project those, we often feel inside as though there's something lacking, but we look at others and they seem to have everything. But meanwhile, they feel as though there's something lacking and they're looking at us and, and wishing they could be like us. That's one thing I've learned that's interesting. Another thing I've learned is that I've, I've met so many incredible people, but I've also been surprised to discover how a lot of these people who are very successful and very high achievers can still be really lacking in self-confidence, which initially surprised me. Now I've just come to expect it. And I've discovered that no matter maybe how much money you earn or, or what your job title is or how old or experienced you are, you seem to have the same doubts and insecurities as anyone else, which has been interesting. Another thing I've observed, Prosper, is that I meet people and I, I can just tell from talking to them that there's something in particular, whatever we're talking about, where if they were to just do it, wow, they would be so successful, but they're not willing to take the first step due to a lack of confidence. And I, I just want to scream at them, no, no, do it. You're going to succeed. I can tell. You just have to take that Chase first step. by the collar. <laughs> exactly. But so I can see something in them that they can't see in themselves. And this is something that, that as I, I hang around with more people and I have more of these conversations that that really becomes clearer to me that we all we or the vast majority of us we're capable of so much more than we realize but we don't take the first step and if you don't take the first step you'll never achieve anything but if you just take the first step that will inspire you to take the second and the second will make it easier to take the third and one little step at a time, you can achieve amazing things, but most people don't even start. And one more one more thing I'll share with you, Prosper, that I've learned from all these lunches. I've discovered that when we grow up, we often get put on a default path. And this may be 
a good default path or a bad default path. It, it's something that's it, it's based on the on our parents. It's based on the people around us. It's based on our school friends. It's based on our teachers. It's based on the culture in which we're living. We kind of put on a default path. And if we just go through life on autopilot, we're going to stay on that path for the rest of our life. And as I say, it may be a good path, it may be a bad path, but that's kind of the path we're on. Most people don't realize that you can actually get onto another path in life. There are other options. Or if they do realize, they it just seems too scary to even try. Now, I know a bloke who has a marketing agency, he has a podcast. This bloke grew up in Zimbabwe and he discovered that there was another path in Australia. I think he had an Australian teacher who really inspired him. And he had the courage to jump onto this other path. It must've been very scary, but I also imagine that there were probably a lot of people who grew up around him who didn't even realize there was another option. And maybe those people are still on the same path. Absolutely, absolutely. When you're talking about that blog, I just started looking around wondering, who is it? Is it that? How many lunches are you actually having? Thank you so much for that. Now, I really like what you touched upon there, Nick, because, um, you know, one thing that normally happens, and, and I'm going to say this with almost love and respect, in the first world, there is not um, a, a ceremony or a a marked event that either a man or a woman, and I'm saying this with love and respect, no, no gender issues, um, you know, uh, implied, where a man or a woman is actually tapped on the shoulder that it's your turn to lead. And we call that initiation. So you either go through some sort of uh, cultural norm or you go out and maybe leave in the forest and then you have to make your way back home or something that really puts you on a journey to self-discovery and start trusting your own path. If you can lead yourself back home, that's the one that I did. If you can lead yourself back home and it's usually back to your heart, that is one thing that then lets you go into the world that, okay, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm an adult. So, what you're talking about is there's a lot of fully grown maidens walking around that haven't been tapped on the shoulder and nobody has told them, hey, it's time for you to leave. It's time for you to grow up. And like you say, it is systematic. And one of the things that if people would realize that the path that you're on may not actually be uh, the one that's prescribed for you, but something happened along your path. You were introduced to hypnotherapy. And I wish that very person could also be introduced to my kids. What happened? Uh, <laughs> hypnotherapy. Uh, well, well, that's funnily enough that this is something that's come about as a result of these lunches that I'm on. So for most of my life, Prosper, this is going to sound strange, but I basically haven't eaten vegetables. I, I just didn't. I just didn't like them. And I'm now 44, and when I turned about 40 or so, I started thinking more about my health. Uh, I guess I'd, I'd reached a certain age and I started thinking, oh, you know, maybe this this thing of not eating vegetables, maybe maybe that's going to catch up with me one day. I, I was very healthy and fit and I looked fine and I felt fine, uh, but I thought maybe one day that'll catch up with me. And early on in this journey of having lunch with 500 strangers, I, I met this great bloke named Paul, who, who amongst other things is an expert in, in health and nutrition. And I think about six months after meeting Paul, we became good friends and we see each other and talk a lot. We were catching up for lunch and he told me about this vegetable shake that he has every day. And he suggested I try it. Now, in the past, I would never have tried it because I don't like vegetables. I don't do vegetables. But it's funny, having these lunches had had changed my mindset and had, I think made me more open to new experiences. So I promised him I would try it. To my astonishment, I liked the taste. And so I decided, you know what, from now on, I'm going to have one of these vegetable shakes every day as a meal replacement. So I started that in the middle of 2020, and I, I, I still do it to this day. And so now suddenly I was getting all these vegetables, which was great. And after doing that for about two and a half years, so this is now late 2022, and slowly my attitude towards vegetables had changed. I'd stopped seeing them as the enemy. I read a wonderful book on health and nutrition uh, written by a friend of mine named Bryce. And 
one of the great bits of advice in this book, Prosper, was you should have vegetables with every meal. Now, for most people listening to this podcast, they'll probably think, well, obviously you should, Nick. Uh, but to me, this was a bit of a revelation. I thought, yes, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to improve my health. But but how? Because I, I don't like vegetables. What can I do? And I pondered this for two days. And then I suddenly thought, ah, I wonder if hypnotherapy can help me. So I found a hypnotherapist. I, I sent her an email. I just found her randomly on Google. And I remember the subject line of my email was, this is going to sound really strange. And I asked her in this email. opened it. Yes. Do you think you could use hypnotherapy to cure me of my aversion to vegetables? And she called me back and she was supremely confident. She said, yes, Nick, I'm sure I can. I don't know how many sessions it's going to take, but I'm sure I can. So I, I went and had a session with her in February 2023. And as it turned out, I was completely cured after one session. And since then, I've just been eating vegetables left, right and center. And part of the reason I think the hypnotherapy works so much is because my mind was open to it in a way that had never been before. And I think part of the reason my mind was so open was because of the personal growth that I'd experienced during this 500 lunches adventure that I'm on. Uh, so it's funny how two things that seem completely unrelated, meeting strangers and overcoming an aversion to vegetables have actually had some sort of link. And one thing has led to another and has had to, led to a massive improvement in my life. Fantastic. Since you're a content writer, we're going to be expecting some veggie recipes on your LinkedIn coming up anytime soon. But what you just mentioned there is something that is remarkable. You went in with an open mind and obviously you're not rigid to what you thought was, um, you know, the way to be. Have you felt any difference in your temperament, in your, um, you know, your health or just your vitality just because you've started consuming vegetables a lot more? I, I haven't felt any difference. So if we go back to the middle of 2020 when I started having one of these vegetable shakes every day. That didn't change at all how I looked or felt. And if we go back a few months ago to when I started having vegetables with every single meal that also hasn't changed how i felt or looked but i'm sure internally good things have been happening and i think this means that whatever bad thing was going to happen to me in the future as a result of not eating vegetables now isn't going to happen fantastic that's that's an amazing story right there and um if you could give me the number of the hypnotherapist i think i've got two kids that might <laughs> use that mindset turning around vegetables. When we were growing up, Nick, we were instructed to eat vegetables first. So there's this whole concept of eat the frog first. When, when you do the hardest task or the biggest thing that you are supposed to be doing, even when you're working, uh, by the end of the day, you you know, you know it's, it's smooth sailing because you've had the hardest thing that you don't want to eat. The thing about vegetables is usually they don't have flavor and they don't really excite a kids. And also, I've been teaching my kids to eat veggies first, um, and then they can uh, play around with their food as long as the main sort of concepts have been uh, consumed. Now, I think content marketing is just the same as well, you know, where it's 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 about creating engaging content and telling stories like you have just done right now, because some people might not understand that they're going through a problem, but if you put it in story format, then that would actually help them understand, wait a minute, I might also be going through that. And it's really about understanding your target audience, because if you're going to be talking that story to people that are vegetarians, they're probably going to think, wait a minute, what's wrong with this guy? And, you know, you also need to make sure that you are relating that story, targeting the pain points of the people that are receiving that message and really providing them with a valuable solution like you have. Okay, if you can't eat vegetables, try try hypnotherapy, right? Well, how do you actually ensure that your content addresses maybe specific pain points of your target audience and it actually provides them with the valuable solutions that they're looking for, um, you know, in their practices? Well, every client is unique because every client has a different audience 
and they want to get different messages out there to that different audience and they they have a different objective. So before my company, Hunter and Scribe, before we start working with clients, Prosper, we find out, we, we ask clients, who is your audience? What is your objective? What messaging do you want to deliver? Uh, what sort of style and tone do you want to adopt? Once we know that, we can then create content that meets the client's criteria. So, so the important thing is just try to understand the client's unique needs and objectives upfront. So instead of creating one size fits all content, you're creating content that is tailored towards the client's needs. Absolutely. And obviously, by you doing that, it entails that the content is consistent because at the end of the day, if the person is just going to be spraying and praying with their marketing, it's not going to work. Now, what strategy do you actually recommend for maintaining maybe consistency in content creation, ensuring that it actually aligns with uh, brands, messages and values? Ah, well, I think first you need to get clear up front on who it is you're targeting and what your objectives are. So, so I think you need to be crystal clear up front. If, to quote or to paraphrase Lewis Carroll, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So it's important to know exactly where you're going. Then it's much easier to, to plot your path. In terms of making sure you stay the course, there were some interesting words that were in your question. Um, you talked about consistency, Prosper. You talked about maintaining uh, the, the content output. And I think those two things are really important. Being consistent and just persevering with the content. Probably the biggest mistake I see people make with marketing is being inconsistent, doing it for a little bit and then stopping or just doing it on an ad hoc basis, when you get around to it, when you feel like it. It's really hard to succeed in marketing without publishing content on a regular, ongoing basis over the long term. So you, you need to be consistent and you need to set up some sort of system that is going to allow you to maintain that output over the long term. Fantastic. Now, you would understand, obviously, that the platforms that we're giving content to, Facebook, LinkedIn, they own none of the content, but once it's on there, it belongs to them. So a real effective content marketing strategy just goes beyond maybe blog posts and articles. It actually encompasses you know, various formats, um, you know, like I've mentioned, you know, social media, videos, podcasts, infographics, it becomes a little bit overwhelming for somebody who just wants to disseminate financial advice or real estate um, advice. How do you help your clients determine which content um, you know, formats are suitable for, for their needs? It, it goes back, Prosper, to who they're trying to target. Um, so... Uh, most of my clients, their clients are business professionals and business professionals tend to be active on LinkedIn. So if if you're looking to target business professionals, LinkedIn is an obvious place to do it. And it's also important to find out what the objectives of, of the client are and what sort of tone and messaging they're looking for. Once you know those things, you can understand where, what channels they should be on and how their content should be delivered. Fantastic. So what sort of misconceptions are you sort of coming across uh, or challenges that you encounter when you're working with clients in the property and finance sectors, um, especially when it comes to the content marketing aspect of their business? Oh, so, so a few things come to mind. So one there's a common misconception that, oh, everyone is, it's too late because everyone's doing content marketing. And the reason you think that, imagine you're an accountant, for example, you go on, say, LinkedIn, and you see all these other accountants publishing content. So it's like, oh my God, every accountant's doing it, it's too late. But, but what people don't appreciate is actually almost no accountants are doing it. The reason it seems like every accountant is publishing content is because LinkedIn will only show you posts from people who actually publish content. So they won't say, look, here, here's a big gap where we were going to put a post from Bob Smith if he published a post, but he didn't. So we're going to put a big gap instead. 
they're only showing content from people who actually publish content. There are no gaps from people who don't publish content. And because it's just one content, one bit of content after another, it looks like everyone in the world is publishing content. The opposite is true. Only a very small minority are. So, so that's one misconception that everyone's doing it. Actually, very few people are doing it. Another misconception is, oh, you know, if I just publish one piece of content or a few pieces of content, I'm suddenly going to get a million new clients. I wish life worked that way. It doesn't. That's kind of like saying I'm overweight, I'm unfit, I'm going to go to the gym once or twice and I'm magically going to lose 50 kilos. That is not how life works. It, it does It does how the work for that aspect. <laughs> I, I wish it did, but it doesn't. I mean, there's no get-rich-quick scheme, whether it's in marketing or fitness or anything else. And kind of the final misconception I'll throw at you is, is a thing called corporate propaganda. So corporate propaganda, what I mean by that term is the sort of content that basically says, look at me, I'm the best, buy my stuff. Now, none of us like reading other people's corporate propaganda. If we see a post that someone says, look at me, I'm the best, I'm, I do this, I do that. I've got these game-changing products and solutions. None of us are interested in reading that. But there's this bizarre misconception that even though we don't read other people's corporate propaganda, that if we put our corporate propaganda, everyone will want to read ours. And it's just not true. If we put out content that is just excruciatingly boring and self-absorbed, no one is going to want to read it. We don't read that sort of content when other people do it. So why would anyone read it if we do it? So, so to just kind of go back to those three misconceptions, Prosper, there's this misconception it's too late because everyone's already doing content marketing. Actually not true. Very, very few businesses are. There's a misconception that you can put out just one or two bits of marketing or the occasional bit of marketing and you'll magically get a million new clients. You won't. You need to do it consistently over the long term. And then there's this other misconception that if I just put out really boring, self-indulgent content that people will be interested in, they won't. They're only going to consume the content if you make it interesting for them. Fantastic. I mean, the whole look at look at me charades on LinkedIn or on Facebook, you know, everybody is, is really focused on their problems, their pain points, and what's in it. For them now speaking of what's in it for them somebody might have been watching this video for the last 25 30 minutes and thinking wait a minute how else can i get help from nick what would be the best way that uh you know people can get a hold of you well i work with property and finance professionals and if they're looking for help with content prosper they can find me on linkedin i'm very active on linkedin alternatively they can email me nick at hunterandscribe.com Okay. At the time of recording, how many lunches have you done? Huh. 324 out of 500 lunches. 324. Uh, right. And how many How many have left? I'm going to try and do the math real quick. Uh, uh, 324. So 176. All right. Cool. Do you have any um, sort of... Um, wish list of people that you want to uh, tackle on your endeavor to do this last 176? Well, there, there are a few types of people I'd like to meet. I'd love to meet uh, a musician. I would love to meet a politician. I would love to meet a pilot. And there is also a specific person I'm, I would like to have lunch with for number 500 which is Adam Goods. So I, I don't know if Adam is a subscriber to your podcast, Prosper, but if he is, I would very much like to have lunch with him as my 500th lunch. Adam Goods, I'm going to show you a photo as soon as we finish this, and it's going to blow your mind. And um, what are we waiting for the photo to load? Okay, we're looking ahead. The future... Um, you know, looks like 176 episodes, um, um, lunches that are left, and also in content marketing, there's a few trends um, that are coming up, and there might be a few changes coming up. You know, based on the new technologies that have um, graced 
<laughs> the internet, so to speak. Now, what what is your sort of plan to either stay relevant and to keep, um, you know, working predominantly with the pro uh, property and uh, finance uh, industries, uh, especially with their content? Well, I like to eat my own cooking, Prosper. So the way I'm going to stay relevant and the way my company is going to stay relevant is by doing some of those things mentioned earlier, which is publishing content marketing regularly and an ongoing basis and making sure it's interesting and relevant and helpful for our audience. And I know that if we do this regularly and over the long term, we are going to differentiate ourselves than the vast majority of other content marketing providers because most people aren't out there publishing content marketing. So I know that if we publish content regularly, we're going to get visibility, we're going to get credibility, we're going to differentiate ourselves from our rivals. And I know that's going to allow us to establish ourselves as a trusted expert with these property and finance professionals. That's going to allow us to stay relevant. That's going to allow us to keep generating new business. So that's very much our plan. It's not one of these uh, kind of get rich quick schemes. It's not you do some tiny little thing and you get these magical results. It's very much a plan that involves hard work, ongoing commitment, long-term thinking. But I know that's what gets results. It, it, it's not these miracle diets or these get rich quick schemes. It's doing these little habits just day after day after day that compound over time. So, so that's what we're going to keep doing. Fantastic. Now, Nick, I can't thank you. Well, thanks. Um, you know, just so you see, I've actually met Adam Woods himself, but I wouldn't uh, be able to help you get a hold of him. But if he does show up, can you promise me one thing, Nick? I, I, I'm sure I can. What would you like me to promise you? Please, when he offers you to give you his autograph, do not refuse it like you did with Sean Wayne. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, you're being very well briefed. I, so, so this is a, a strange story, but back in the year 2000, I was living in Southampton in England and Shane Warne, he, he played county cricket and he, he went to England in 2000 to play county cricket and he actually played for Hampshire, who, who were based in Southampton. And one, one Saturday, I, I went to a friend's place in Southampton. And as I was walking home to my place, I happened to pass the cricket ground. And I could see that the gate was open. So I thought, oh, I'll just walk into the cricket ground. And I remember I had this street directory in my hand because I, I was using it to navigate. This was back in the year 2000, before we had Google Maps on our phone. And I walked into the cricket ground holding this book. And I turned the corner and and I basically literally bumped into Shane Warne. He, he was right there. I just kind of bumped into him and he turned around and he looked at me and he saw me standing there holding this book. And there were a bunch of people queuing up to get autographs from him. And now I just bumped into him behind him holding this book. And he turned to me and he said, do you want an autograph? And all I could think of to say was no. And uh, he he looked very surprised and disappointed, and then he just turned around and went back to autographing, uh, giving autographs for everyone else in the queue. Oh no, that phone book would have been so valuable today, you know. And you could have used it for your cold calling antiques. <laughs> I, I I possibly could have if I could go back in time, I would get Warney's autograph. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, talking about time, I think we've had fun here and I really, really appreciate your time, uh, Nick, and your insights um, basically on your journey, on what it is that you're doing with the 500 lunches and everything else um, you know that you've got lined up for you and the team at Hunter and Scribe there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prosper. It's been a lot of fun. Fantastic. Now, for those that are watching from home, thank you for tuning on to this episode of the Online Prosperity Show with our guest, Nick Bendal. And um, we hope you really gain valuable insights into the power of effective content marketing, especially for those that are in the property 
and a finance industries where Nick is an expert in. And from Nick's personal journey uh, to, you know, his expertise at Hunter and Scribe, we hope you've learned how quality content, um, you know, can actually create uh, a business that's profitable and enjoyable. And remember to apply these strategies so you can stand out and save time and actually grow your brand. And if you're going to be looking to uh, connect with me, we'll put his details in the show notes there. Now, join us next time for more inspiration and actionable tips on achieving online prosperity. Bye for now.